Hi, it's Wesley with 22 Zines. Uh, today I am going to highlight probably my favorite category within my tarot deck library, and that is my punk and goth as fuck decks. <laughs> and I'm really excited about it. I was sort of inspired to do this because I just got a new deck in today, um, and I think it definitely fits in this category, so we'll just start there. That is the Goblins and Gardens Tarot deck, um, which I kind of saw on Kickstarter, but I don't know, just didn't back it. And then the other day I just sort of impulse bought it, and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, and the reason that I ended up purchasing it is because it felt very zine-like, and it felt very hand-done, and honestly it felt super punk, or almost like, I don't know if proto-punk or or nerd punk or something like it definitely it it had that very hand made hand um hand drawn quality i mean it's not i mean it is drawn but it's not like the deck itself is drawn the deck itself is a collage deck combining these uh botanical photographs and botanical imagery with cutouts from classic dungeons and dragons and other fantasy rpg uh, books and, and systems, <laughs> um, which is such a rad combination to begin with. Oh my god, this, <laughs> this fucking justice card, it looks like this awful metal album, like, <laughs> with these, this, like, minotaur breathing fire and these pillars of corn and this super out of place blue crossbow. I mean, I, I love it. It, it feels so genuine, and it, you know, the art that was utilized feels like it was drawn by a bunch of nerds with ballpoint pen on graph paper after their calculus homework, you know? Or or if you know um, Trogdor from Homestar Runner, like, this is sort of the the art that Trogdor was making fun of <laughs> in a in a happy, playful way, you know, especially this this dragon. What I sort of especially... <laughs> look at this guy. What I sort of especially like about it is it feels... Um, it feels like even when the anatomy is sort of messed up or wonky or just when the art in general is kind of wonky, it feels very genuine and... and <sighs> raw and there's, there's something really nice about that where like <laughs> these are people who are not artists or at least do not do not call themselves artists that's not really their primary passion um they didn't learn to draw i mean look at this thing this totally looks like just just a crazy monster doodle that somebody did <laughs> this gorgon head but you know the point is, I it feels it feels like the people that drew these way back in the you know seventies and eighties were not trained artists. They didn't draw the sketches beforehand. They really were just like you know like this is a good example. Okay, so I drew this face. Let's add some super cool samurai style armor on it. Yeah, what if he's actually a golem and his arms are made of rocks and and it. It feels like a very natural creative progression as opposed to having a defined vision in advance and trying to execute it in a very perfected way, um, which is very punk. <laughs> it's so punk. And, and of course, it comes together now in this collage zine-like way, especially in the text. Um, you can see it's it was printed out and it's been cut out sort of um, imperfectly. And put on, you know, and it just, it's really obvious that these were hand cut, you know, because you can see the little, um, the little bits of, of paper that were cut by scissors and not by computer. I don't know if a lot of people would be able to notice that, but just, you know, being a zinester myself, I really appreciate that. And it feels very genuine and true to the, um, era and true to the style that they were, they were doing for this. So... Yeah, this is basically the one that inspired me to collect all of my punk and goth tarot decks and, and put them all together and highlight them, because they're definitely, you know, I have 
quite a few of them, and there's a reason that I have quite a few of them. I think all the decks that I have that don't fit in this category, or almost all of them, are animal decks. Oh, oh, I forgot to show the backs, and the backs are so cool. Okay, hang on, we're, we're digging it back out. Okay, these are the backs, and, you know, they're cut out stripes of, of patterns from, like, D&D world map kind of things. Um, and they just have this really cool effect when you uh, show the side of it, or this one. And there's this shiny golden guild gold gilding, that's what I'm trying to say, that, you know, just feels like... I feel like the artists who actually made these drawings would be so, um, so happy to see their work being reused in this way. It feels so true to the actual spirit of the artwork, and, you know, it just feels very genuine and honest, and I just love it so much. So that's definitely... I would totally count this in the category of punk deck. It's called the Goblins and Gardens Tarot Deck. Now, um, going on in the punk theme um, is this one that has a very different flavor, I think, uh, and I have talked about this before. Uh, it is the Sapphic Enchantress Tarot, which is hand-cut. It's a majors only that's hand-cut by artist Aisha, Yer Aisha Yeramashi- Aisha, oh my god, Aisha Mira Yashin, who did the uh, cover for one of my zines, and I met her and we just had a fabulous time talking to each other. Um, this is one of those things that sort of at first glance doesn't seem like inherently punk, in or how do I put this? It doesn't seem obviously punk in that you know, this isn't the sort of punk artwork that you would be, you would expect to see on, like, the cover of a punk album or something, but the ethos behind it is super punk, super countercultural, and super radical in, um, in sort of, I don't know how to put this, but, like, celebrating ugliness, celebrating traits that are considered ugly, and celebrating all bodies celebrating all women and sapphics of all types and it's just very it's very radical in its ethos uh it also the the art is so detailed but it's all done with basically one width of pen and something about that about having like a limited set of supplies and using that to create something really cool feels very punk to me and then, of course, naturally, just the fact that it is small batch, hand done, hand cut, don't bother with any backs, don't bother with any gilding, don't bother with any bullshit, it's just pure, straight up, fuck, fuck, fucking tarot! <laughs> um, it's, it's so cool. And I just, yeah, I really appreciate the ethos behind it, and I definitely consider this to be a very good representation of a modern progressive punk deck. Like, this is where punk is now, and it's so fucking rad. <laughs> the next one that I have, let's see, what's, like, easily grabbable here? Um, we'll do this one. This is the Lost Hollow Tarot that comes in at 10, and this is <laughs> sort of very classically, classically goth, I don't know how else to put it, um, but you can kind of see what I mean. It's red and white and black. It's, um, it's very dark. It's very creepy. It's got creepy elements. It's got classic goth elements. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, if there's a particular goth subculture that this deck reminds me of, because some of these definitely remind me of particular subcultures within the goth sphere. I don't know that this one does. Maybe just, like, trad or, you know, semi-industrial or... I don't even know what you'd put it, but whatever it is, it's definitely goth. I'm so glad I landed on this moon card because I really love it. It's one of my favorite cards in the whole deck. Funny thing is, I don't actually use this deck for myself pretty much ever, um, but my partner has sort of adopted it as his deck and it is the one deck that he actually uses and gets readings from me and does a couple readings for himself with it. 
um, which I think is cool. Another thing I really like about this deck, it is very diverse in a take-no-shit kind of way. It's not like a... I mean, it... It, <laughs> it encompasses diversity in its take-no-shit attitude, and I think a lot of ways uh, goth and punk stuff sort of needs to do that, especially at this point, to be truly um, countercultural and, and truly, you know, representative of what the sub subculture looks like, for one, and also representative of what the subculture stands for of... Um, being against mainstream racism and mainstream bullshit, mainstream ableism, like, you know, I think that's, I think that's important, and I'm really glad that this deck has that, because goth can sort of have a reputation for being a very white subculture, especially in America. And that is such a load of crap because there is there are so many cool goth people of all races and in all countries that are making really fabulously amazing stuff. There's like a really cool metalhead goth uh, group in Botswana that um, has like its own um, it, it, its own uh, sub style of leather jackets. I don't know how else to put it, but the point is, <laughs> the point is that this deck is a really good representation of what goth subculture actually looks like, and of course, still represents it very beautifully and very, very badass. I feel like this one, it's it's easier to see why you would call this deck goth more than. Uh, <laughs> anything else, really, any other aesthetic. <laughs> anyway, um, so the next one I have is a n another sort of mass market, very classically goth deck. This is the Murder of Crows Tarot, and again, this is, like, super easy to see why it's goth. It's sort of what... I get the sense that this is sort of what people who aren't themselves goth think that goth is all about um, in in imagery, because it definitely leans into the scary aspects of it. Okay, hang on one sec. This deck still smells like like new deck smell chemicals that are, you know, super addictive to, <laughs> to just pick up and sniff. But anyway, like, I feel like this is the kind of goth that um, parents were warned about um, that their kids would be like if they listened to the Beatles or whatever the fuck that parents were freaked out about. Um, like, look at this one. It is, it is very tragic goth. It's, it's very trad goth and it's, um, it's sort of intense, but n not necessarily in like an aggressive way. It's intense in an ethereal way in, like, a way that encompasses sadness and a lot of other things. I guess, yeah, this is a very gloomy deck. Like, it's a very sad deck. Sad and scary. And I think that's kind of <laughs> important. That's And that's also what goth is, is sort of not shying away from that, not shying away from those emotions and generally, you know, encompassing that into, into your life and acknowledging those experiences. <laughs> um, yeah, this one is probably one of the most clearly gothic cards in the deck. So, yeah, I think this one's pretty obvious. It definitely fits um, fits into the category of goth decks, Murder of Crows Tarot. All right. <laughs> I'm doing the standing up, which I'm starting to feel like was a mistake because my back is fucking me up right now, but you know what? We're I'm going to I'm going to keep going and do some stretches and edit some bits out when I'm grunting and being uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's pick another one. Okay, so this one, let's do this one, the Hush Tarot. The Hush Tarot, this is what I feel like, it's kind of like a proto-goth deck. I don't totally know how to describe it, but proto-goth proto in the sense that it's like Stevie Nicks and sort of hippie gothic in a way 
Like, does that make any sense where, you know, this is a super goth card. Um, it's super sad, it's super intense, it's five of cups, so, you know, naturally, I think all five of cups are kind of goth cards, but you know what I mean, just image-wise, image, image -wise, it looks like that. Um, but this is something that if you were to look at this in isolation, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, if I had only seen this card, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh yeah, that's from a goth deck. Um, but I think taken on the whole, and taken with all the pieces put together and just seeing the entire deck and the mood of the entire deck, it feels very, um, very gothic and also very nature-based. So it's like, you know, I sort of like, for myself, for my own, um, if I had to create a subculture for myself, I, it would be like flower child goth, and that's kind of what this is, the sort of, um, yeah, like, nature-oriented, 70s hippie-influenced bohemian goth. I really like a lot of that stuff, and this definitely has that mood. I feel like <laughs> if the deck is kind of a downer to work with sometimes, then it definitely fits into the category of being a goth deck. And this is kind of a downer to work with sometimes. <laughs> but, I mean, look at that. Like, how classic, how classic is that? It's so cool. Um, next, because it's right next to me, we'll do this one. I love this deck. I got it recently-ish, and I have just been using it all the time. Um, <laughs> so I did a reading for my partner's mom with it when she came to visit, and she loved it so much, and she was she's not really a tarot person herself, but this deck is the one that made her feel like, oh wow, I want to read more about this, I want to learn more about how to do tarot. So <laughs> I ended up giving her that copy, like the copy that I had done a reading for her with, and rebuying it um, <laughs> for myself. Anyway, this is such an interesting deck. It's, it's again, it's very imperfect. I feel like that's kind of important to me to really capture what I appreciate about goth and punk subcultures is that they are imperfect, and so I like when the art is imperfect, um, in the sense that it's not classically beautiful, it's not like every line is perfectly straight and all the widths are consistent, and, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily look like this person went and became a classically trained art student, um, but it feels raw, and it feels creative, and it feels creepy, and, um, and empowering in that way, the idea that anybody can do art and it's more of an expression of yourself and your mind and your subconscious and all of the doom and gloom, deep, dark things that are inside you as opposed to an expression of artistic talent or, or artistic, um, you know what I'm trying to say, like, like technical skill. These are so cool. There are so many of these that have two eyes on the same side, and I really like that. The other thing I like about this deck, as you can tell, it is pretty RWS, but it doesn't, it's not distractingly RWS. Like, I don't know how to put this, but sometimes RWS clones, I get almost distracted by them because I keep just thinking of the original RWS, and so when I'm looking at the image, I'm like, okay, why is this why is this like this? Like, it looks too much like the original RWS that when I see it, it's like something looks off because it's not the RWS card that I'm used to seeing. It's like a slight variation on it that just, you know, makes it harder to really engage with that particular image because I feel like I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at something that's like slightly off. It's like I'm looking at a, at a, a repainting of the Mona Lisa and not the actual Mona Lisa and they're similar, but there are enough differences that it kind of bugs me. <laughs> that kind of happens for me for some RWS clones. Um, it doesn't happen with this one because I guess the art style is just so different and because there's so many interesting, interesting bits about it. The one thing about this deck, it is independently produced and sort of along the lines of the imperfection, this is something that might bother some people, and it does kind of bother me. Let me think if, let me try to find two examples. You can kind of see how the printing on the Justice card here is 
blurrier than the printing on the Four of Swords, and it's probably just, you know, the the DPI was scanned at, or how large the image was originally drawn, because I definitely get the sense that these were not, you know, drawn with a ruler on, on pre-sized pieces of paper or anything like that. It was kind of just, as the inspiration came, it was drawn, and so they're all going to have different thicknesses and different, and not the cards themselves, but the ink used to draw, it's going to have different thicknesses. You know, you can see that here too, like the the marker that was used to draw the lines for the Ace of Swords appears to be a lot thicker, whether it was actually the same marker but just drawn on a smaller scale or not, like, the, it is a big difference. Um, when I was originally doing a flip through of it, it totally bothered me and I was super disappointed. I was like, oh, I was so excited about this deck and I'm not going to be able to work with it like this. Now that I've been using it a couple times, I, I could not give less of a shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, I just, it's, it's so beautifully imperfect in other ways that, you know, the little beautiful imperfections of the DPI just kind of seem almost natural, <laughs> if that makes sense. But for people who are especially annoyed by that sort of thing, I would, I, I wanted to bring it up. Maybe at some point I'll do a deeper dive on this. But anyway, the two cards that I really wanted to highlight that felt the most gothic out of this deck or sort of sealed the deal, it's like, yep, this is a goth as fuck deck. Not just because it's black and white, but because look at this. Look at this rat on the Three of Swords just being stabbed, and it just feels so... Again, it feels like something that my little wannabe goth teenager self would have doodled in a class notebook, and I really love this. And, you know, the very wavy lines for the bird's wings, the hand that, it's very clearly a hand, but, you know, it's certainly not a, an anatomically correct hand or anything like that. But the emotions are so powerful and so deep and so sensitive, it's like, that is what, that is what goth is to me. So, anyway, kind of spent a long time on this deck, but I really... I like it a lot. That is, again, the Blind to the Sun Illustrated Tarot. Really fabulous deck. Okay, this is another deck that on the surface is not super obviously easily put into the category of being a gothic deck, but I think that the... and this is the Brady Tarot. I'll just say that before I forget about it. Um, and it's not just the black box <laughs> that makes me feel like it counts as a goth deck, but rather that... The images are are intense, but they are real. They don't feel artificially intense by any means. I don't know why I just flipped through the guidebook there. Well, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's an animal deck that ha it is... Um, these are linocut and printed with ink, so you definitely get the hand-done quality of it. I get the sense these are all going to be upside down, so I'll just do this. You get the hand-done quality of it. You can really feel the the drawn... Um, not It's not drawn. Why did I just say it was drawn? You can feel the traditional medium expressed in it, and it's kind of funny. I didn't realize that until I started talking about it, but these sort of beautiful imperfections, like the little traces of ink that are left over from the printing process, those just really speak to me, <laughs> really feel especially especially true and especially honest, and I really like that. But I guess I'd say that it's not even especially the artwork of this deck that feels gothic. It's more the mood of it. Like, it's, it's a very... it's a very intense deck sometimes, or just... just moody. Like it's a it's a moody it's a moody deck and it's kind of a sad deck sometimes because it doesn't shy away from including things in the natural world like you know this one right here has a coyote that has some killed birds on it and for the coyote that's success although that's failure for the birds <laughs> but you know what I mean it's like it 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 doesn't shy away from actual things in the natural world that are sad and and depressing and difficult. And that is what goth does. It looks at things in the natural world, or it looks at these natural emotions of sadness and fear and anger and all of these things, and seeks to actively appreciate and express them. 
And so I feel like this deck is coming from the same place. I would describe this as like a goth at heart deck. Oh my god, look at this fucking, look at this boss up. I love it. But anyway, I would describe this as a goth at heart deck in the sense that, like, for people who have seen the TV show Daria, Daria herself is not aesthetically gothic. She does not dress in goth clothes, but there is no denying that she is a goth, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Goth at heart. All right, next up is another what I would call a punk deck, and that is the Autonomic Tarot. Um, it is super weird. It's very, like, industrial gothic. Um, like, actually, you know what? We'll just flip straight to the High Priestess, because I think this exemplifies it. It's a very, like, 80s industrial Berlin gothic kind of deck. Um... Again, it's all hand done, and so the printing process is imperfect. The shapes are very expressive, but also pretty creepy. I mean, look at this! Look at this hanged man. Um, I think that the the simplified color palette uh, it feels very new wave, um, sort of like a classic classic eighties eighties industrial goth club in a warehouse <laughs> thing. Um, this is a 30 card deck, so it's a it's sort of a non-traditional tarot structure um, where it has the 22 majors and then it has the beginning and end or the ace and the 10 for each of the each of the suits. But anyway, yeah, so so <laughs> I would definitely include this in sort of a a punky goth, like, like early goth when it's still in that transition from punk to goth and has a lot of new wave influence. That's what I would describe this deck as exemplifying. All right, next up is something that I think pretty clearly fits into the goth category, which is the Seasons of the Witch Sawin Oracle. Not really an oracle deck person uh, in general. In comparison to tarot decks, I just prefer the structure of tarot. But I kept seeing this one, and I kept wanting it, and so I got it, and it fits very well among these other gothic decks. Um, a lot of people have probably seen all these images before. I think it's pretty obvious why it fits into this category. Um, one thing, again, which is a thread that I kind of didn't notice until I was looking at it now, is that these are also hand done imperfect you know anatomically and and technically imperfect uh images they're watercolor and you can or maybe gouache they're probably watercolor and you can definitely see the paint in them and i really appreciate that oh my god look at this this is sort of like that <sighs> wispy witchy goth but kind of in an early sense um, so not the sort of, like, 2014 witch goth revival, but, like, the original <laughs> witchy goth, um, that sort of, uh, branched off from the, the, like, flower child bohemian 70s gothic. Um, like, these are the, um, Sisters of Mercy, uh, and, like, Enya <laughs> goths. Um practical magic, the craft, those sort of classic gothic witchy movies. This one especially is like <laughs> so classically like yeah, classically recognizably goth. I actually really like this oracle. I'm glad that I got it. I think it kind of you know broke me out of my shell. A, a little bit, or broke me out of my traditionalist tendencies. Oh my god, how many more do we have? We got like one, two, three, four, five, six, three. we got like six more? So we're about halfway, because I counted 15 at the beginning. This here is the Orphic Tarot, which I got from a Kickstarter, and it is really, it's really the art style that just, I had to have it. It felt very, um, zine-like. It is pen and ink and black and red and white. And so, of course, I had to have it. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Um, the mythology or like the mythological basis is actually centered by someone who practices an Orphic tradition, which I think is pretty cool. I don't actually know much about the tradition, but I have really... So I guess I, I'm, I'm saying that I use it mostly on an image sense, and then I'll, I'll read about the story that's being depicted here. But either way, I just think it's so fabulously interesting and so busy. There is so much going on. And I love this <laughs> more is more so many intricate lines and details. Um, I think maybe part of the reason that I like a limited color palette or, um, yeah, like part of the reason that feels very gothic to me is, again, because it feels sort of accessible, it feels countercultural, it feels unprofessional. And I say that in a very good, adoring, anti-capitalist way. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, look at this stuff. Okay, there was one card in particular that I really wanted to show off because I feel like it just... Well, here's a good one. <laughs> I just feel like it exemplifies so much goth and satanic shit. That's the other thing is like, these myths are... These are obviously based off of Greek myths, but they look like satanic devil imagery. <laughs> Look at this, like, like, pregnant with a crawfish and these sort of demon-looking figures below. You know, I think that it fits in very well with the generally known <laughs> gothic um, set of symbolism and set of, set of imagery. And it is so beautiful. Okay, okay, we're gonna keep going. This next deck is one that I just have in Handmade Box that I need to remake at some point, and it is the Gorgon's Tarot, this fabulous, famous, round tarot deck, um, which is just so cool. I feel like this totally fits in this sort of um, industrial gothic way. It's the funny thing is, like, this is computer-generated, so it doesn't even have the hand-drawn thing that I was talking about earlier, but I still feel like the combination of patterns and everything feels like a genuine playfulness. And, I mean, that's the funny thing about goth. It's like, it, it and, and punk, too, is like, they have these reputations for being especially sad or deep or dark or angry when... I think part of what makes the subcultures what they are is that they are intentionally able to play with that. And they are using that and they are approaching it in in sort of a an expressive way, and that makes it very playful. I mean, there's a reason that goth includes very unusual chords, there's a reason that goths are into fashion and all those things, so it's a sort of a, it's a matter of expression and when you are playing with your expression, then, I mean, that that's what you do. You're playing. That's what I really like about this one in particular. I, I love all these, all these patterns. Um, this deck, I know it says somewhere in the guidebook that this deck took a really long time to make. And so a lot of these were started in sort of the early days of personal computers. <laughs> and you can, I can kind of tell in a, in a really amazing way. <laughs> and I think the other thing is that a lot of the symbolism especially feels very gothic to me. You have the snakes, you have crying eye, you have um, more snakes, a lot of snakes on this one. Um, you have like this, this spiraling abyss. We're a mystic spiral, but we're thinking of changing the name. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's got hearts, it's got roses and flowers and things in it. Um, it's it's dizzying, engaging, and it's also black and white, and that definitely helps. <laughs> um, I sort of have had my finger on the devil card here, because what really made me feel like this is totally a goth album, or, or, or a goth deck, is because this looks like it could be the cover of a Rush album. Not like it looks similar to the actual covers of Rush albums, but like if this were the cover to Subdivisions, 
I would not think twice. I'd be like, oh yeah, th- this this makes sense. It's very naturally. They did a really good job on that really cool album art. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the funny thing is, like this this card in particular, like seems like it could represent subdivisions. Just if you sort of if you sort of looked at it, because <laughs> it's got this big this big separating line in between, and they're trying to reach out to each other, but they can't because the man is watching them. <laughs> so cool. And it can also sort of talk about like longing for connection and that sort of thing. So yeah, this, I think, I think this totally counts as, as a goth deck. All right. This next one is pretty obvious why I would include it in a goth deck video, which is the Tarot of Vampires, the Ian Daniels vampire, um, vampire tarot. This deck for some reason has been getting like super popular lately, which is kind of cool. I guess primarily because of the guidebook, but also because there's kind of a, like, uh, thought trend that's been happening lately, too, that people are interested in that sort of approach, and that's kind of the way that this deck is influenced, and and a bunch of stuff, but anyway, um, I had it before it was cool, uh, but I never read with it, so (laughs) take that for what it is. But yeah, this is like you know, paintings on the side of a van, gothic. This is the very vampiric romantic gothic. This is, you know, <laughs> it's it's goth. Like, pretty obviously. I don't know what to say. And also, like, the, um, the meanings are very deep and dark and intense, and I think, like, right at, in the guidebook in many places, it sort of points out how we often shy away from emotions that are perceived as negative things like um, fear and sadness and anger and that sort of thing. But um, we shouldn't have to do that. And, and a lot of people actually do enjoy deep, dark experiences and not just goths, but you know, that resonates very heavily for goths. And that's basically what goths are intentionally trying to do is bring more of that, um, fear to the forefront in their lives, that deep, dark, sadness, fear, all that stuff I was talking about before. I really like this Daughter of Knives, the uh, Page of Swords. Um, I love this Lover's Card, I guess. I think in the guidebook it's said that it's a man and a woman, but I totally see a lesbian couple here, and that's kind of why I wanted to buy it, because I was like, I was I was just impressed that they did that. I, so, I, you know, I guess he didn't, like, intentionally do that, but whatever. (laughs) I will see whatever I want to see in these bad boys. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, a lot of people have been showing this deck off lately, so you've probably seen quite a bit of it. All right, this is another one of those decks that I feel like it doesn't automatically for everybody fit into the category of a gothic deck, but for me it totally does, because all that I can think of, this is a deck that was drawn in the late 90s. It's called the Fantastical Tarot, um, and I got it on eBay. (laughs) Okay, so the story that I see when using this deck is so much of, like, a 15-year-old girl in the 90s who is goth and wants to get into tarot because she thinks it's cool and deep and mystical and looks for, like, the creepiest, spookiest, gothest deck that they have at the local metaphysical store, which caters primarily to, you know, um, hippie, witchy women who grew up in the 70s. And this is, like, the closest thing that she could find of, like, yeah, this is suitably goth for my discerning tastes. This is suitably intense and and edgy, <laughs> but it's both artistically, like, you know, the, the figures are very, um, sharp in general. Like you can kind of, you can see the very sharp collarbone, sharp jaw, sharp cheek indent, the big eyes, you know, the point is this feels like the best, the closest facsimile to a goth deck that she could find. And therefore by her, being a goth and using it, she has now effectively integrated this style into the goth subgenre. Hooray for her. She, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that story makes any sense, but that's all that I can think about when I use this deck. And, you know, 
the dragons on the back. That seems like, yeah, these dragons are cool enough for me. <laughs> And I want to be absolutely clear, I do not mean any of this in a disparaging way. I think that, I think that it is so cute, and I'm kind of, I kind of, the reason that I enjoy using this deck is because I didn't really get that experience. I didn't get to be that edgy goth teenager that I wanted to be because I had so much other shit going on in my life, like so much trauma that there's no way that I could have leaned into this sort of intensity and sadness without just without it being really harmful and and it wasn't really my my focus and within my capabilities and so now that I feel like I have a firmer footing to be able to explore things and explore myself now I sort of want to get back to all the things that I wanted to be and try out as a teenager but never really got the chance to. And so this is, this really allows me to do that. Like, it's so funny people will describe, like, an inner child's deck. This is probably not what most people are thinking when you say inner child's deck, but that's totally what it is for me. It is my inner goth teenager deck, and I love using it for that. All right, so the next deck that I have is the New Wave Tarot, and yeah, so it basically is, it, it might as well be called the Goth Tarot. I mean, Goth and New Wave have like a ton of overlap, so they are very represented in, e in each other, and I think that this deck is a perfectly um, good representation of this. I mean, look at this background. Doesn't this look like the most 80s goth shit you've seen with this rose and stuff? Um... Anyway, so each card, um, or pretty much all the cards, of course I'd pull up the one exception, has, it features a different uh, new wave or goth artist from the 80s, and it's like this really neat digital collage thing. It's got eyeliner sticks as the wands, <laughs> which are so great. Um, microphones as the swords, and then teacups, and... Um, like these uh these records as as the discs or as the pentacles. Anyway, so yeah, I think that this is very early goth. I mean like this yeah. Or <laughs> a lot of early gothic imagery, early new wave imagery, um the stuff that goth sort of eventually separated from is was all sort of in the same category of new wave and so it includes all this. I love this fucking David Byrne magician. I'm sure I've stopped on that card before when describing these things. I love this. This is like the... Oh, yeah, and of course... <laughs> Robert Smith and Mary and the... Um, the lovers. But anyway, like, this is sort of what goth was originally almost, of like going out to the thrift store and getting a whole bunch of clothes that are six sizes too big for you and cutting them up and drawing them out and wearing super heavy eyeliner and dyeing your hair yourself and all this stuff like back before goth was even generally known or generally accepted you know I think that goth is significantly more accepted today than it ever was you know it's it's evolved away from its countercultural roots in in some ways I think there are not in other ways. So anyway, I'm not going to get into that, but <laughs> the point is, yeah, this definitely counts as a goth deck. I mean, anybody who has Robert Smith as the King of Cups, that's, that deck has to be a goth deck, like, almost by definition. And, of course, I'll pull up <laughs> Susie Sue's famous shoot as the High Priestess. And the deck I'm going to end all this on is Dame Darcy's Witchy Cat, which is so cool because I feel like it combines so many different aspects of goth and punk Um creation and style and ethos and everything into one single deck and it is so zine -y. and I feel like that's kind of what zines do is they they are like a physical artistic um expression of of goth and punk in in sort of a, a different way that's not so based on aesthetic um but anyway like first of all this death card totally looks like something that would be drawn in the notebook of a 13-year-old goth, right? <laughs> in the best way. And again, like I was saying before, you have this 
imperfect hand-drawn quality. Um, you know, some of the lines are, some of the colors are going outside the lines, some of the lines are imperfect. That's okay, because it's about the expression, not the technical level. Um, you have this cool Victorian um, frame, and of course a lot of Victorian imagery and themes, so it's a very recalling uh, Edgar Allan Poe and sort of the the origins of goth as we tend to know them in, the, you know, happening around the turn of the century. Um, black cats everywhere, all kinds of cats everywhere, but especially black cats um, a lot of places. You've got, uh, like, the funny thing is it's so colorful. This is not a black and white deck. It has a ton of colors in them, but the lines are so defined and so... Um, edgy, I guess, that, that it doesn't become overwhelming, or it doesn't especially feel like a colorful deck. Um, or maybe it's just these big, thick, black outline things happening. Um, it is intense and edgy. It is also playful. Uh, <laughs> it is the whole package, and I, I truly feel like this is the deck that best encapsulates my goth zine-loving punk at heart um feelings <laughs> i love dame darcy's work so much uh this is the one deck that i'm really i was really attracted to the theme of so i i didn't go for the mermaid tarot and that sort of thing but i have a lot of her other work like from her original zines uh meat cake and um it makes me very happy that now there's this tarot deck that i that that captures all of that so well. And I think that this is a fabulous place, a fabulous deck <laughs> to end things off on is Dame Darcy's Witchy Cat. Thank you very much. It was very uh, validating and invigorating and energizing and just made me very happy to uh, get a good look at all of these goth decks and be able to share them with you. I ha will have a list of all of the decks featured down in the description below, and I will see you later. Bye!